Welcome back. It is now time for Myron Mahendra, CEO of Oxemarine, to give us a presentation. Welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to start, first of all, for, uh, for thanking Berto to, um, to introduce us here to this Tech Day of uh, Technology of the Future. Um, we, we are, after all, um, a company with our own sort of uh, technology, which we believe is engineering the future. Uh, my background, um, uh, I'm a chartered accountant. I've been involved with the project since 2012 from its inception. I've uh, been a CFO of the company in 2016 and, of course, CEO since 2019. Now, we, we have developed effectively the first high-powered diesel outboard in the world. And you can see from the stats, a million outboards are sold every year uh, so far. And they are the second most pollutive uh, combustion engine you find anywhere in, the, anywhere in the planet. The gasoline lawnmower is the, the most pollutive. And this is crazy in terms of the environment that it creates, the havoc that it creates from, from, uh, from this highly polluted engine. So how should we be engineering the future? Well, I think this is where we come in, um, that we are presenting a product that is pretty much taken from the automotive industry, which is highly regulated. It's gonna be something that's gonna give a huge difference to the performance for commercial and governmental users. So we believe we are part of that solution by providing this, the first high powered diesel outboard engine um, and also solutions around the patented technology that we have that could now use also electric propulsion, but also biofuel as well. So our company is small, we have 40 people. We've grown since 2012, innovating our product uh, for different markets so that we provide a solution for commercial and governmental uh, uh, application, but also creating a safer environment for the people and for our planet. So our projection for engineering the future is developing the technologies that's not currently available. First of all, in the diesel outboard segment, um, followed by electric propulsion, which we're working with a number of uh, uh, partners in, in evolving this, and also the opportunity to develop a hybrid solution for different types of applications that's suited for that. And here we are with the, with the, you know, the electric uh, propulsion dual prop um, that we're currently working on. Well, how did this all start and what does this all mean? Why are we so different from others? Well, I think if we look at this basic concept of using a automotive engine, it actually sits horizontally, not vertically. And you say, how do I transfer the power from that engine down all the way down to the propeller? Well, this is how it started off with uh, our co-founder, Right, you know, pretty much writing on a, on a napkin and saying, okay, we could use a belt propulsive system to, to use this. Now, it seems fairly basic, but but actually it's it's technically it's challenging to, to get it done. Uh, but we since 2012, we've proved it and we've got a product, all products out there that we know it works. More importantly, we patented this this simple concept um, and that in the US and the EU. It's also modular, right? As I explained before, we're using a base automotive engine and we're using a belt, which is actually an industrial belt uh, that you can actually pick off the shelf. Um, we're using a gearbox, which is an industrial gearbox that's used in inboard engines in the marine application. And essentially, we're pretty much putting all together as one package that works. A real innovation, a true innovation is, is the lower leg. How do we manage to deliver all that power using that belt all the way to the propeller? And here's how the modular system works, as you can see. Here's the, the engine that sits on top of it, the primary transmission, the gearbox, and of course, the secondary transmission all the way to the lower, the lower leg. And here's the comparison. I think people need to understand how this actually works. The, the, the outboard or the petrol outboard in its basic concept, as you can see, it's, it's fairly simple. It actually been a simple concept since, well, 100 years ago. Ulla Emenrud came along and said, you know, he was actually sitting in his backyard. His kids wanted some ice cream. He said, I need to get across the lake to get some ice cream. 
use a sailboat, but couldn't get that in time. Or in fact, the ice cream melted by the time he came back. So he said, you know what, I'm going to devise something that's going to be consistent, get me there and back. And he developed this first petrol outboard, essentially at the time, because there was no diesel available. Um, it was vertically mounted. So it is this very different concept to, to the traditional uh, um, automotive engine. And therefore, it's unique only to that application. It cannot be used for anything else. So therefore, if you compare to the automotive engine, you can see billions of euros, decades of use. They've come up with a highly regulated environment where they have to operate these engines. It's highly, highly efficient compared to the gasoline outboard, which is highly inefficient. They have been given exemptions for mission because the argument goes that it's not big enough compared to the automotive industry and therefore highly pollutive. The other real weaklings that they have here is actually the bubble gear. If you look at the bubble gear, it's tiny um, compared to the industrial gearbox that we have. And the reason for that it's because it sits under the water line. We have too big a gearbox, it slows, it's a drag. In fact, if you look at the diameter of the, uh, uh, of the propeller um, um, the torpedo, that if you increase it by just an inch, you increase the volume by 50%. So, that's, that's, so from their perspective, they are limited in the size and therefore makes it very vulnerable. It is the most vulnerable piece there. So highly, high powered uh, gas, gasoline outboards don't last that long in terms of not just the engine because it's, uh, it's, it's only meant for you know, pleasure use, but also the gearbox where if you have a crash stop, it just breaks. So commercial users and government users want some, something that's an alternative that's going to be stronger. So we've developed this concept where we've got the engine, which is an automotive engine, highly efficient. We've got a huge gearbox up here, which sits above the waterline. Therefore, we can make it big enough and of course, it transmits all the way down to the torpedo, which has nothing in there, and therefore we can make it actually even smaller and even more efficient. So we have all the pluses, 45% more fuel efficient. Um, we've got um, a gearbox that's huge and very strong, durable, reliable, and we've got you know, a smaller torpedo that makes it very efficient through water. And this is the big difference, fuel economy, a huge difference, 40%. Uh, fuel economy, uh, and that means we're kind of helping us, you know, helping the environment to a large degree, but also commercially, it's saving our customers, our governmental customers, a lot of money. From a safety, uh, from a range perspective, from an offshore perspective, they can go further, far further than anybody else, and that's great for for, for us and for, for you know, and for the environment. In fact, one of our customers, early customers, with the Gluten is a cruise liner. They use gasoline outboards previously. And because the capacity that they had to run, whenever visiting or exploring islands or wildlife, they had to come back at lunchtime to refuel, feed the customers and go back out again. So they spent many journeys doing that. When they started using our, uh, our engine, they spent all day exploring. Customers were very happy. They came back at the end of the day and still had a half tank of fuel left. So from a fuel efficiency perspective, commercial perspective of saving money, it was big. More importantly, the cruise, the mothership, we shared the same fuel. And therefore, that meant they didn't have to store gasoline separately. So from a safety perspective, this is a huge help because if the, if the boat caught fire, they had to shift the fuel out very, very quickly, and it costs money to do all of that. The other thing, of course, from a, from a commercial perspective is the torque. Uh, the torque is, is huge in terms of pulling the boat, pulling heavy loads. Uh, and so this is critical um, for, for doing you know, heavy-duty work. Um, and you can see this also from a... Um, Regulation perspective, we are the most, from in terms of regulations, uh, in terms of fuel efficiency, we are by far the best, even better than the inboards themselves. And of course, emission levels, environmentally extremely friendly. Um, huge levels reduction in carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide by up to 99%. That's, that's big uh, compared to the others. So we know that um, you know there are target customers that want desperately want this. Uh, safety is critical. Uh, it's non-combustion. So a lot of governmental um, and search and rescue uh, need that sort of uh, type of fuel. Oil and gas. You, you can't have sparkling lighted um, products in in the uh, gas fields. Tender boats. Uh, of course, they share with them, you know, the mothership or. Uh, taxi, uh, taxi boats or ferries all want to use diesel because that's f uh, mainly available uh, in the harbors uh, run by big ships. And of course, fishing in harbor. As you can see, fishing a fisherman here carrying heavy loads of, uh, uh, of fish. Um, he's working all day, pretty much, five, 700 hours, uh, which is a lot. And, and we can, you know, our product can take 
that sort of BT, uh, as it were. And safety and rescue that we have, of course, uh, Swedish Sea and Rescue Society in Sweden have been using our product. They absolutely love it. They can troll all day uh, without having the need to refuel or even worry about having a, a highly combustible engine, uh, a fuel load on, on their boat. And of course, with Degluten, our customer working in very cold environments, and this one is particular is in Antarctica. And you can see the, the competitive uh, you know, landscape with the different sort of outboards, but the most important thing is that the final column here, uh, fuel efficiency compared from a, from a euro to um, usage basis is extremely, extremely low. Mm. Now, just looking at our business model, um, we're a small company, as I said, we're focused on engineering, and we pretty much outsource as much as we can in terms of manufacturing. As you know, we use BMW and GM as the powerheads, best-in-class systems. We buy industrial belts straight off um, uh, the factory, which is already pre-made for other uses. Um, and we, of course, use parts from a variety of uh, well-known specialist uh, suppliers. We assemble it, of course, uh, by a third party at the moment. Uh, you probably see later, we've got one in the US and, and one in Poland for our different products. Um, and so that makes it very efficient from our perspective uh, in terms of we focus purely on engineering aspects of the, the product. Uh, and of course, distribution, we use distributors who are specialists in their territories, who understand they work with commercial and governmental customers primarily. Uh, they understand it or the needs of their customers and we work very closely with them in developing um, sales and the order book um, you know, over, over, the, over, over the last few years. Um, and this is the management team here. Of course, uh, my role will change towards a more of a sales orientated role, um, but the team has been uh, pretty solid um, and I believe that this will continue as we go along. And from a production perspective, um, it's, it's looking really good at the moment we have production in two countries, Poland uh, and the US, uh, with the 300 horsepower in Poland and the 200 in, uh, uh, in Georgia in the US. And our sales here, you can see we, we, we have sort of had disruptions during COVID where we took a strategic decision to actually stop production and hence why the sale has, sales in, the, in, in 2020 has been quite low. But now that's picking up with the introduction of the 300. And you also can see the development of the gross margin. This is quite important because we have been making um, huge strides in terms of improving the, the, the product and also reducing the costs of the product. And therefore, the gross margin development here is moving, trending in a very positive direction. And that's primarily at the back end of it, as you can see, Q1 2020. Uh, half of that is from the, the new 300 that's, uh, uh, that's been gone into production and we're selling it at the moment. We expect that development to continue. And the other aspects of uh, you know, our sales will which will dominate later on is after sales aspects, which such as spare parts, accessories, service kits, they command a significantly higher margin. And as we mature as a business, you'll find that those margins start to contribute to, to the bottom line. An order book has been growing quite well uh, over the year. Uh, the last couple of quarters. Uh, we expect that to stabilize a little bit as we start ramping up production. Uh, the focus is going to be pretty much um, on operational side now as we fulfill our customer needs. Our burn rate, as you can see, is also coming down quite dramatically uh, because we are now moving away from the phase of R&D, more focus on operational side. Now, the beauty, of course, is our business model and the way it works because uh, we are highly leveraged from a operational expense perspective. So in other words, uh, when sales take off, because a lot of it has been outsourced, our gross margin contributions will start to increase dramatically, but not the operational expenses. And therefore, we should expect to see a lower growth in terms of operational expense compared to, to the income growth uh, in that sense. So we, we hope to achieve, obviously, um, you know, sort of profitability in, in due course as we increase the volume of sales quite, quite rapidly. This is, of course, is our, our targets for uh, you know, financial targets, the organic sales growth, which whilst we didn't achieve that in 2020 because of COVID, but if our target for 2021, you'll see over from 2019 to 2021, that should continue on a consistent basis, on a, year, um, on, on a sort of a two-year basis, for example. Same with EBITDA margin, that's our target of 25% uh, plus by end of 2024. 
And of course, we're also looking at trying to get operational cash flow positive 2021 uh, once we get to the ramp up dramatically in, in Q4. So that's my presentation um, from OX Marine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Myron. Very interesting. Um, I would like to kick off with a question about Q1, when you commenced production of the Oxy 300. Uh, could you elaborate how, on how this is developing and how is the demand for this product? Yes, yeah, so our order book is skewed towards the 300 uh, at the moment. Um, it's, it's more sort of related in the US as demand's picking up uh, quite nicely. Um, the profit margin is more significant, of course, uh, in the 300. And the reason for that is that we, we share 60% of our components with the 200. So in terms of a cost basis, it's actually relatively stable. But of course, we're charging more um, because it is a premium, premium product and horsepower sells. So everybody knows that the more horsepower you have, you can charge a premium to that. Mm, thank you. Um, and you expect to be cash flow positive already this year. Um, it's our target if we can hit those uh, the volumes uh, in terms of ramp up for, for Q4. Yeah. And how is the production ramp up coming along? It's, I think we all know that uh, there's a supply chain disruption uh, worldwide. And of course, we're managing that carefully because uh, we have to husband our resources carefully. So we're now having everyone aligned to make sure that we can hit the numbers for the end of the year, but obviously making sure that we can ramp up in a, in a sensible um, and, and sort of um, in a more coherent manner uh, so we can align everybody together. And can, can you see that the kind of the effect of the pandemic on your business is uh, going down? What do you see any signs of that? Yeah, I, I think we the, the, the business certain segments, of the business like the cruise lining business, for example, has been impacted. Right, it's fairly clear. Uh, the tourist business, but the oil and gas and governmental, um, the work boats, uh, the fishermen, that that has been growing dramatically. Uh, so there, there is a good, nice skew towards that where we're working on a good number of projects uh, on that basis. Okay. And uh, what is the key technological innovation that you have developed, would you say? It's primarily our lower leg. I think you'll find that uh, that is so unique in itself because it took, it took us four years to develop that lower leg, which is the gearbox and the belt, the primary transmission and second transmission. Uh, and that's unique to us and it's a patented technology uh, as well. So, and that's both in the EU and the US. And it's a highly engineered product. Uh, it's, uh, it's one that we, I believe we all feel proud of as a small engineering company that started off with six people and growing to 40 and more. Good. So, and then on a final note, uh, what do you look forward to in the coming 12 months? Well, we hope to establish ourselves as a, as a premier uh, engineering product for the marine, for marine application. Uh, we hope to work on other applications. I mean, our engine, for example, can use biofuel, uh, as an example. Um, we hope to back our customers with good customer experience, right? To support them on after sales. So to make sure that they come back to us time and time again. And I hope to establish ourselves as the unique provider for solutions for commercial and governmental users using fuels that is far more efficient, more environmentally friendlier. Hmm. Okay, that sounds like a win for all of us. So thank Indeed. you once and again for an, for an interesting uh, presentation and best of luck on your journey. Thank you so much, David. Thank you.